Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editorial Director of Low Power Engineering. I'm here with Lil Ruby from Apache Design, Laurel Rosati from EVE, Kalar Rajendran from East Silicon, Barry Pangerly from Mentor Graphics, and Krishna Balachandran from Synopsis. Krishna, from your perspective, when you look at verification, how does power change things and what has to be done in terms of dealing with all the complexity that it will add to a design? Power changes everything in the design, tools, methodology, IP, services, a combination of all this is what is going to make a low power design successful. Uh, power complexity rapidly going up with uh, advent of mobile devices and also government regulations uh, as well as green initiatives. So low power verification is fundamental and simulation techniques which rely on just doing a zero one uh, simulation are not good enough. You need a voltage aware simulation to deal with multiple supply voltages. It has to be combined with static verification that checks the integrity and connection as you go down the implementation phases. You have to do power verification at different levels of abstraction, starting at the system level and all the way till gate level. And you have to mix that up with also making sure that it's not garbage in, garbage out. In other words, the power spec, which could be the IEEE 1801 UPF, itself has to be verified to make sure that you're capturing the power intent correctly. So at every stage you have to... Barry, from your perspective, when you look at uh, design and from the architectural level all the way into the verification, it's getting far more complex and power adds a whole other dimension to this. What has to change and how do we deal with it? Well, Ed, I, I think you're right that it's certainly adding another level of complexity. And one of the things that's really kind of unique about power is it really affects the whole design and verification flow all the way from the system to the back end, very lowest levels of uh, physical verification. So we're really looking at, I think, something that's going to drive uh, the design and verification methodology starting with the system level. If you're going to develop a optimized system end product for power, you have to be looking at what's happening with the hardware and the software and you need a way to be able to carry what's happening with the software at the application level all the way through this process to make sure that anything where you've got special transitions or something different is happening, you're going to be switching different states, uh, that you're able to capture that. And that is uh, a challenge. And I think the industry is working uh, on the semiconductor and the EDA side in terms of putting together standards to help keep that uh, as orthogonal as possible so that people can kind of continue to use uh, flows that they're familiar with, but be able to layer this in. And at the same time, it's obviously creating additional stress in the whole design and verification process and that there is additional complexity that needs to be taken care of. And as you go along, you want to be able to track this. So starting you know, with virtual prototyping, if you can get software uh, platform that you can use for doing optimization and then get it in the hands of the software developers so that they can develop the software while the hardware team is working simultaneously and getting a better flow of information across those two teams. Uh, when you get to the actual functional verification, for example, if you're verifying at an RTL level, being able to go ahead and verify the functionality and then be able to layer in the power intent on top of that. And then, of course, when you get to the physical layer, um, you want to make sure that once you've got all these different components put together on a single chip and you're going to be turning them on, turning them off, running them at different voltage levels, that you can actually make sure that uh, from an integrity standpoint your power grid's going to hold up and that when you actually get your chips back from the fab, they're still going to work. So, Will, from, when you look at uh, verification, it's already complex enough. What power adds another dimension to this? How do we deal with it? So I think that from the power verification perspective, uh, there are several aspects to the verification task. One is to verify the functional intent of the device um, operating under many different modes of operation, complex functional scenarios, complex uh, state retention schemes, turning on and off power supplies. And that the next aspect of this is um, looking at power consumption of the device and how power consumption changes from one operating mode to the other, all the way down to the physical design implications with um, looking at power grid integrity, overall power integrity of the device. Again, very much dependent on various application scenarios, various operating modes, and so on. 
So I think the best way to really start thinking about tackling this problem is to look at the applications, to start envisioning an application-driven verification flow where the software that's running on the hardware is actually what is verifying the operation of the hardware. Until that happens, uh, we are relegated to using our existing methodology with test benches and test suites. Now we have to adapt it to the low-power techniques. I think that has its place, but I think it absolutely must evolve to be an application-driven verification. Kalar, from your perspective, we've got a lot of complexity in a chip design these days and actually a system design. Power adds another dimension to this, and verifying it is a problem. How do we deal with it? Yeah, so let me take a crack at it. Let me first define the uh, problem and then the solution. So the problem really is, a uh, simple way to look at it is that the uh, power verification is actually driven by the usage mode, whereas the functional verification is driven by the designer and the functionality. So having defined the problem, how do you solve it? The solution really is a combination of having good tools that can actually help uh, you know, uh, do the verification, but it also depends on the methodology and also understanding the usage modes and exercising all the usage modes. So really to get a good solution, if you're a customer who wants to get a product with uh, low power uh, uh, that was intended, you really need to combine tools and provide, uh, basically use a service provider who has good methodology and also uh, insight into the implementation details uh, so you can actually bridge the gap between what the intent was at the RTL level all the way to the uh, implementation. So, Laurel, from, from your perspective, we've got a lot of complexity already out there in terms of the design and the verification. Power adds a whole different element to it. What is it, what's the problem and how do we solve it? Well, the good news is that uh, from an, an emulation perspective, which is essentially what EVE is, is all about, um, complexity is an invitation to, to lunch. Um, we deal with complexity <laughs> every day. Uh, the essence of life. Um, there is another element in, uh, to, to take into consideration um, when we deal with emulation systems, which is accuracy. Uh, in, within, within, uh, within an emulation uh, machine, you have the most accurate of, of the models of your design, short of real silicon. You have essentially a hardware implementation of your design. Um, in the case of processing or um, power management, uh, the challenges in an emulation system is to model uh, the power domains, the isolations, the uh, state retentions, and all of those things that um, uh, are coming into play in the recent years. In the old days, gated clocks were the technology to control uh, power management. Today, there is, a, as we heard in the in the roundtable, many more things. And so, the challenge for an emulation system is to find an accurate way to model uh, those uh, those uh, those uh, effects.